Okay, boys and girls, we are ready to start. Okay, let's see who is here. Ooh, we almost have a full boat. We still have a couple of people that are not here yet, but we're going to start. Anyway, so um, we were moving along nicely. Last week, we covered quite a bit of Rome. Um, now, before we get started, does anybody have any questions about what we covered last week? Um, <clears throat> I think some of the highlights of, uh, of what we covered last week, and let me, let me go back to the beginning here. Now, again, uh, as I say all the time, this is an open forum. This is an open class. Um, it should not be considered just a lecture from me. Uh, if you, any of you want to get involved and ask questions, make comments, uh, please feel free to do so. I will be happy to answer any questions you might have research any questions you might have if I happen not to know what it is, what the answer is. Um, so it's an open forum. Ask away, interrupt, uh, send messages, raise your hands, do whatever it takes to get my attention and I will uh, answer, answer you. But some of the highlights, Rome at, at the height of its reign was huge, humongous, was mammoth. Um, they say that uh, Europe, the West, uh, has never been as unified as when the Roman Empire was at its heights. Uh, even today with NATO and the EU and all of that, uh, None of that comes anywhere close to the way that the West was unified under Rome. Uh, they say that you could travel from England, you know, what is today England, all the way to Egypt uh, through all the many roads that Rome had built with basically one passport, right? Uh, back in those days, they didn't have passports the way we have now, but people would have medallions that were inscribed Rome on it, and they could show that, and that would give them free passage through certain areas, because then they would be identified as Roman citizens. And they say that they could travel, you know, from all the way from England, all the way down to Egypt. Um, or beyond, uh, and nobody would bother them because all of this, this whole area here was considered to be Rome, was considered to be part of Rome. So it was a huge empire. And, uh, but the thing that a lot of times when I'm teaching classes like this one, similar classes, or I'm talking to students about Rome, uh, the question always pops up, how did Rome begin? Uh, was it Remus and Romulus, the ones that began, that uh, started the city? And the answer to that is that nobody really knows. And as you recall, I told you about this idea of mythology, the fact that mythology, the, the job or the function of mythology is not necessarily to lay out a history or, or anything like that. Uh, it's really multifunctional. Right? There are many things, you know, first of all, yes, there is a certain spirituality involved with mythology, uh, also a sociological approach, uh, a teaching approach. But the bottom line is that mythology for the most part is not true. Uh, the events that mythology uh, depicts or that mythology narrates are 
are usually not true. Uh, in some cases, they are somewhat similar to what uh, maybe maybe happened, but for the most part, uh, so Romulus and Remus that all of that happened. You know, we we're, we're not really sure if it did. Most likely, some of it did happen. Um, certainly, there were people living in that area prior to the Greeks' arrival. Um, the Etruscans were in that area, and the Etrus and Etruscans, by the time the Greeks got there, were fairly advanced society. You know, they were a fairly advanced society. They were certainly very artistic. Uh, they had they, they they had a lot of uh, sculptures and paintings, and uh, they were very good at metalworking and things like that. So it wasn't like that area was empty, and all the poof, something happened, and uh, and a society or a city was begun, but rather. An involvement. It evolved slowly. More people arrived. It grew. More people arrived. It grew. So it, you know that's really basically what's going on. So there is a founding myth to this whole thing. There is a, a, a mythology, a myth, uh, but we use that myth only as a reference point, as a point of reference not because it really happened. You know, the, the twins, Romulus and Remus, it is very doubtful that they were breastfed by a she-wolf. That, that, that would not be something that we could expect to happen. Uh, a wolf would have probably eaten those two kids, um, not necessarily adopt them and make them her children, you know, her kids. Uh, so I, I'm sure that that really did not happen. Um, the one thing that we do know happened is that there were seven kings, right? Prior to, uh, uh, to the Roman Republic organizing itself, Right, so you've got the kingdom over here, and uh, kings ruled Rome during this period of time, and this is called the Roman Kingdom period. And then the last king, um, after the last king was actually assassinated, was um, you know uh, was taken out. A republic was formed, and what that meant was that. Uh, the people elected a Senate, uh, and that Senate uh, pretty much ruled as a group. And uh, the amount of senators that were um, that were functioning, that were working, ranged from as little as maybe a hundred to as much as three hundred senators at one particular time. Um, and, and the people would also elect a leader, one leader, uh, and that leader would be in place for one year only. And then after that, they would elect someone else. He was expected to step down and then someone else would be elected. Um, that didn't hold uh, for a long period of time only because greed. You know, greed is the one thing that about humans that we can count on all the time. Uh, people want more. So in some cases, one of these leaders, one of these leaders would step in a position of power and then he would not want to step down or he would make a deal with another leader to share in the power. Um, and eventually that the Republic to a point at which right around Julius Caesar and Mark Anthony and Augustus Caesar, in fact, Augustus Caesar was the first emperor of uh, Rome. 
emperor, emperor, one that got to wear the little leaf thing on his head, um, you know, the wreath on his on his head, the wreath that acted as a uh, as a crown. Um, and then at that point, the Roman Empire began. And the Roman Empire, uh, it's called the Roman Empire because one emperor would rule. Uh, there would be a Senate underneath that emperor, but the Senate was more of an administrative body than a governing body. They took care of things. You know, the Senate would take care of the roads, would take care of the finances, would take care of, you know, things like that. But the reality was that the emperor would be the one to, uh, that called all the shots. Uh, that eventually collapsed. And that's, and we're going to go through that here in this class. We're going to talk about all of that. So you have an understanding until the time that the Roman Empire collapsed. Um, and especially, uh, first, first it divided. Let's, let's get that out. Uh, it divided into East and West. The Eastern part of the empire were, uh, uh, was called Constantinople, named after Constantine, the emperor who accepted Christianity, who made Rome a Christian country. Uh, and then the, uh, but eventually that empire also collapsed uh, when the Ottoman Empire came in and, uh, and invaded that area. The Ottoman Empire was in Anatolia. And we're going to talk about that next, uh, you know, next uh, class. Right. Once we finish with Rome, we're going to talk about the Ottoman Empire. and We're going to talk about all of that. Uh, what we're not going to talk in this class is going to be this period of time right here between the time that the empire was split in half uh, and the uh, Byzantine, it was called the Byzantine Empire or Constantinople, that period of time, I going to leave it for later for I want to join that with the Holy Roman Empire, which is the empire to the north of Italy, uh, Germany and all of that. Um, an empire was created there called the Holy Roman Empire. And that empire and the Byzantine Empire need to be looked at together. We need to look at that together. Um, and understand how it worked. Uh, so we're going to leave that out. We're not going to touch that. We're going to end this class right around 600 uh, AD, uh, uh, you know, 600 after Christ, um, or what is also called the common era or current era, you know, after Christ was born, you know, our our year, our numbered years, you know, the way we, we measure time. Um, so that's basically the story. So anyway, so let's take a look at the kingdom. And I think we left it right here. We left it right here. Um, this was the last slide that we looked at. And uh, in this slide, I try to tell you how where Rome was located it's there's seven hills and uh, Rome is right here the the initial uh, Roman city which this is the the uh, leftover right the uh, the leftover city after it's been destroyed uh, and it's still there if you ever go to Rome you can take a tour and uh, uh, I don't think they allow you to go in there and uh, and walk around, but you can certainly look from the outside. Uh, in fact, uh, there's a road that goes right behind here, and where you see these buildings right here, you can you can actually park your car back there and look down, and uh, and also in front, uh, you can go there and look beyond that, and see and have an idea of how. Uh, you know, how, how this must have looked, you know, a couple of thousand years ago, uh, how wonderful 
it would have looked. Certainly, um, Christianity was one of the uh, factors that Rome began to collapse. Uh, Rome had been uh, a warring uh, country, you know, a country uh, run by military people. And uh, once Christianity had come in, you know, Christianity had a way of uh, pacifying people, right? People didn't want to be warriors anymore. The thirst for blood was not there anymore. Um, you know, the Colosseum was a perfect example of uh, people that had a thirst for blood. They like to see people get slashed by knives and swords, and they wanted to see, you know, the gladiators fight one another to the death, and they wanted to let animals loose in the uh, Colosseum and then have soldiers battle with lions and tigers and kill them or get killed uh, by, by them. Uh, that thirst for blood left Rome and that was the beginning of the decline of Rome for you know, maybe good, for good reason, uh, better for the world because Rome, if that hadn't happened, um, it has always been my opinion that had uh, Christianity not been accepted in Rome, we would all be speaking Latin today. We would all be speaking the Roman language today uh, because they were slowly, you know, uh, capturing more and more territory. They were getting bigger and bigger. Um, of course, there was also the problem that they, they, they got so big, they couldn't, they couldn't really handle it as well. That was another, that was another reason. So anyway, uh, so these are the, uh, the seven kings that, uh, that ruled Rome during the kingdom period of Rome, during the Roman kingdom. Remember, three eras, right? Three epics, uh, the kingdom, the republic, and the empire. The kingdom, the republic, and the empire. Uh, these were the, the seven uh, kings that were that ruled Rome until Superbus uh, was overthrown, uh, and uh, and at that point the Roman Senate uh, became more powerful. Actually, they did have a little bit of a Senate uh, back then, even during the kings, and again. The Senate, the Senate back in those days had the same job as the Senate during the empire. Uh, they were mostly charged with the duty of, uh, you know, spending money, you know, representing some of the people, but they really did not have any governing authority like they did during the Republic, during a couple of hundred years during the Republic. Um, but anyway, it was Romulus. Romulus kills his brother Remus, uh, or so does the myth goes. Uh, he became the king, he died, and then they went from there. Uh, Pompilius, uh, Hostilius, Marcius, Priscus, Tullius, and then finally Superbus, uh, Tarquinius Superbus. Uh, and uh, and he marked the last of the Roman kings. So if you want to remember things, uh, remember that there were seven, seven kings before the Republic uh, began. Uh, and uh, we can watch, uh, well, okay, I'm not, let's not watch it because we don't have that much time. However, this part right here, the Seven Roman Kings. It's a very interesting video. And if you hit this link, uh, you're going to be directed to a YouTube uh, video that tells you about the, the Seven Kings. And I highly recommend it. It's really, excuse me, it's really a very, very good video. It's a good video. It tells you everything about each king, what happened, uh, what made this era different 
from the other eras. Uh, but, as, but every time we study Rome, we see a certain evolution, right? It starts here and it evolves through the years, but it, it never really changes a complete 180 degree change. It evolves. It slowly, you know, maybe it gets a little more modern. Maybe they, their military gets a little bit more aggressive. Maybe some emperor makes a deal with another, with someone else in order to split one territory from another, you know, that type of stuff. But it's still Rome. It's still Rome. It's still the bloodthirsty, crazy, militaristic Rome that started back with the kings. The big change, the big, big change came in when Christianity was accepted by Emperor Constantine. That was it. That's when Rome, we can really say that Rome made a turn. Rome was going straight and it made a turn to the right, the left. I don't know what, maybe made a U-turn. I don't know what. But that's the real change. That's when Rome stopped being, in other words, if you were to get on a time machine and go back to Rome around this time, or maybe even a couple of hundred years after the seven kings, and you're hanging around Rome, you're talking to people, uh, you stop by a food vendor and you buy because they did have food vendors. Um, you know, people that would be out in the street selling food like we see today all over the world, you know, um, in the major cities, you go to New York and you got hot dog vendors and you go to Chicago and, you know, and all that stuff. You go to Beijing and you have a lot of a lot of food vendors. So, you know, and you're grabbing something to eat and you're talking to people and, you know, that type of stuff. And then you climb yourself back up into that uh, time machine and you push the lever forward. And you go all the way up to maybe 800 uh, AD, 900 AD, right after, you know, Constantine, right after, uh, you know, Constantine died, you know, after Rome was a Christian country. And, and you look at the Byzantine Empire and you would see a totally different place with people that look the same, you know, they were still the same you know they looked the same but they acted differently and the government acted differently and and everything they did was totally totally different uh and that is the reason why i don't want to go into that period of time during this class i want to leave that to compare that with a holy roman empire which was the german empire right that was the german empire um and, uh, and they called themselves the Holy Roman Empire because they had made deals with the Catholic Pope. Right? But we're going to go into that, and I'm going to explain the, the, whole, the whole thing. It was Charlemagne, just so that you can have a frame of reference. Charlemagne is the founder of the Holy Roman Empire, and he was out of Austria. He was out of the Austrian area. Uh, so anyway, it, it would just be totally, totally different. Uh, you know, the, the country really took a change right at that point. So I recommend you watch this video. Uh, when you get this, uh, the PDF for the PowerPoint, the videos remain, you know, it saves the videos. Uh, so you can click on that and you can uh, watch this video, which is actually quite good. Um, now, by the way, uh, archaeology suggests that Rome began as a confederation of villages on the seven hills of Rome. Remember, I told you seven hills. Uh, the Cap Capitoline is where Rome, the, the Roman city today, you know, the, the ancient Roman city that is all full of buildings that are falling apart and all that stuff is, that's the Capitoline Hill. And it's right here. You can see it right here, this circle. All of these other hills are around it, right? Whoops, sorry, are around it. But this is where, you know, Rome, the original Rome began to be built. 
Uh, and these hills are Capitoline, Palatine, Aventine, Viminal, Quirinal, Esquiline, and Caelian. Uh, the low-lying ground between them was swampy and malarial, meaning that there were a lot of mosquitoes and people would get sick. Uh, you know, mal malaria was just rampant during those days, right? Because it was swampy. Yet the presence of a natural fording place gave Rome some unusual advantages allowing for a larger civilization to begin its development. And this particular Ford, it's called a Ford, F-O-R-D, kind of like the car Ford, is, is right here. This little area right here with this little island on the Tiber River, this is called the Tiber Island. A fort is a place where you can navigate to and actually uh, put your ships, kind of like uh, uh, put your ships there. And that allowed for the beginning of trade. That allowed for the beginning of trade because as ships would come in with merchandise, people would venture down from the hills and they would go here and they would meet those merchants. Uh, and trade is what always allows countries to thrive. You know, when, when countries begin to trade with others and they begin to exchange information and they begin to exchange goods, that's when a country begins to thrive. Uh, tradition holds that Romulus and Remus founded the original city on the Palatine Hills on April 21st, 753 BC. Well, is that true? We don't know. But it's the tradition, you know, it's the tradition. And that the seven hills were first occupied by small settlements that were not grouped. The seven hills, denizens, you know, the citizens of the seven hills began to interact, which began to bond the groups. And, and that's what happens when people begin to come together. That's when things begin to grow. Uh, the city of Rome thus came into being as these separate settlements acted as a group, draining the marshy valleys between them and turning them into markets. Later in the early fourth century BC, the Serbian walls were constructed to protect the seven hills. And the Serbian wall is this red uh, line right here that goes all around, you know, they built the wall in order to protect them themselves from, you know, invasions and things like that. Now, uh, if you ever go to Rome, uh, right here, if you stand right here, looking at Rome, at the old, at the ancient Rome, uh, and you look to the left of that, area here there's a huge huge boulevard i mean huge very wide it's got about maybe four lanes on one side and four lanes on the other a bunch of traffic lights on the other side of the of of this boulevard that's where a lot of the plebes the plebes are the common people not the patricians. The patricians were the people that ran the government. They were the powerful people. Uh, the plebes were they're called plebeians or plebes. They were the common people and they lived in actually like apartments. And amazingly, about 20, 25 years ago, they were building a road through there. And as they dug down on the ground, they found the apartments were down there, uh, you know, and they said, oops, this is a historical area. We cannot build this, this uh, road. We have to stop construction. We got to allow the archeologists to come in and begin to dig and start. And you can actually go there and you can stand on top. There is a road, the road on top and you can look down and see how the the plebes lived, how they lived. And this was the beginning of the downslide of the, the hill, right? So the common people lived below the hills 
in an area that, as it says, was malarial, an area that was swampy, a very swampy area. In other words, they would be living right around here, right in between here. So there's still a whole bunch of, they look like condominiums, actually. It's really an amazing thing. Um, and maybe next week I will research an, a, a video about it, about that area. And I'll try to show it to you guys so that you can see how, you know, how that uh, works. Very interesting. Uh, Rome is just an amazing, an amazing civilization. They were an amazing people. And uh, it's really incredible. I, I mean, this is certainly one of my favorite periods to study uh, because of the influence uh, that they had on the rest of the West, the Western world. Uh, and as I've said before, and I'll continue saying it, um, Greece gave us philosophy, science, thinking, logical thinking. Rome gave us government, gave us military, military tradition, military strategy. Uh, it gave us roads, buildings. They built like no one else. And we're going to look at a lot of that. Anyway, these are the the uh, the ethnic groups that were in Rome, many or in in the boot of Italy. You know, it's a boot, right? It looks like a boot, the peninsula. Um, when the Greeks landed here, a lot of these people were already there. They were already there, but in very small groups. And once Rome became established and they opened their civilization, they opened their city to anybody who wanted to come in and be assimilated into their city. Uh, and they said, you know, citizenship is open to anybody. You, you want to come in? We don't care whether you're from here or there or the other place. If you're able to contribute to our civilization, we're going to allow you. Uh, so... The Etruscans were there. The Etruscans, remember I told you, were very advanced uh, people, uh, artistic, very artistic people. The Umbrians, the, you know, all of these people were there, which is very interesting. The earliest evidence of a culture that is identifiably Etruscan dates from about 900 BC. This is the period of the Iron Age, the Lenovan culture, considered to be the earliest phase of Etruscan civilization which itself developed from the previous late Bronze Age. Now, uh, you're gonna see words like Bronze Age and Iron Age. This is part of the evolution of civilization, right? So the first people, um, you know, they worked with clay, they worked with ceramic, they worked with wood, right? But then eventually they found bronze, they found copper, they found that they could mix copper and other alloy and create other alloys, and they would, you know, come up with bronze, which was hard, and they could create weapons, and they could create tools to do things. This is all part of the advancement of civilizations. And then after the Bronze Age came the Iron Age, and so forth and so on. So whenever you get a chance, and you because there, you, you have to read a lot in order to truly and fully understand Rome and understand what these, you know, um, archeologists and anthropologists talk about, you do need to read a little bit. You need to read some of the stuff and try to research some of this, you know, try to research the Iron Age, try to research the Bronze Age. I can't do it here because Rome is a very large subject and it would, I would have to spend a week or two just explaining to you what the Bronze Age and all of that is. Uh, but anyway, Etruscan civilization endured until it was assimilated into the Roman society. As Rome began to grow, uh, they, first of all, they got into a couple of fights. And uh, one time the Etruscans managed to make it into Rome and, and then they kicked them back out. And, but eventually, eventually Rome won out. Assimilation began in the late fourth century BC as a result of the Roman Etruscan Wars. As I told you, you know, they got into a little bit of a squabble and uh, eventually 
Roman uh, Rome overcame the Etruscan civilization and assimilated them. It accelerated with a grant of Roman citizens in 9C and became complete in 27 BC when the Etruscan territory was incorporated into the newly established Roman Empire. And, uh, and, and this is very telling because the Etruscans were kind of closed society. Um, they would allow people to visit them, but they wouldn't give people citizenship openly and say, oh, you want to come and live here with us? You can do it. What do you do for a living? What can you contribute to our Etruscan civilization? Well, you know, I can build swords. Oh, great. Come over. Bring your equipment over. Sit yourself over there and, you know, and, and we're going to love you. Uh, they weren't that way. The Romans were. You know, the Romans were. They didn't care whether people were even slaves, whether they had been slaves. You know, let's say a guy who was a slave in Greece would run away and gain his freedom um, by, by running away. And then he would land in Rome and he would come in and say, hey, look, I'm, I can be a gladiator for you guys and, you know, and go bang heads somewhere. Uh, or I can be this or I can be that. And if he could prove himself, the Romans would accept him. And they actually had open citizenship, you know, kind of like you want to come in and, and become a, a Roman citizen, you're welcome to do it. Uh, once that happened, Rome separated itself from the rest of uh, the West. No one was doing that. No one was doing that. And that allowed, in reality, that's one of the things that allowed Rome to grow exponentially the way it did exponentially the way it did. Now, this is uh, some of the artwork that the Etruscans uh, uh, contributed. Uh, they are there in Italy now. If you go to, uh, uh, there are many, many museums that you can visit in Italy. Italy is full of museums. Um, I, used to go to, I used to go to Italy on business and, uh, and I never did get, you know, I was there on business, so I didn't, have a lot of time to roam around and go see museums in the Vatican and this and that and the other. But then one year, a few years ago, my wife who wanted to, uh, to travel, I said, yeah, come on, let's go. I, you know, uh, I was already retired at the time. So uh, I said, let's, let's go to Rome and let's spend a little time in Rome. We're going to go to Germany. Then we can go to Hungary. You know, we can do a couple of things. But while we were there in Rome, we spent about three weeks in Rome and, uh, and we went to see, my God, more museums than you could chase a stick at. Every kind of museum, some specialized in bronze statues and, and stuff like that, some specialized in some period or another. Uh, so if you ever go to Rome, make sure that you go to the museums. But anyway, this over here is a, uh, a cinerary. Uh, that's a, an urn in which uh, you take someone who has passed away and you incinerate that person, um, you burn them and you take the ashes and you put it in here. Uh, and the same thing with this one. This is another urn made out of metal, exquisitely sculpted uh, that would hold the ashes from a dearly departed. Uh, this over here is a pendant you might look in there and see the swastika. Uh, you might say, oh my gosh, Nazis, Nazis, Nazis are here. Uh, this swastika, even though it's called the swastika, uh, is not the Nazi swastika. The Nazi swastika goes the other way, it goes like this, right? Uh, this swastika going the other direction um, has a Hindu, uh, Indian, Eastern sim uh, uh, symbol or, or origin, I should say. Uh, and I've read many different things. Uh, every time I read something about those swastikas, I read something else. Gets to the point that I don't know which is true and which isn't true or, or which, uh, you know, because it, it did represent many different things for many different people. 
Uh, for instance, there is an Indian tribe in uh, right next to Panama, which uh, in Central America, which I've, I actually wrote one very large article about them. Um, and that article went to, uh, to, a, uh, to a culture magazine that I write for occasionally. And for them, it had to do with the direction of the world or the, you know, the seven, the four, you know, north, south, east and west, right? East and west. That's what it had to do for that particular tribe of Indians. Now, it wasn't the, they used this, this swastika. They used this swastika here, right? Uh, not the Nazi swastika. So for them, it meant something. It meant something. That doesn't necessarily mean that it has that same meaning for all the people. Like for instance, the Etruscans. I don't know what the Etruscans saw in this particular swastika, how they got it, how, whether it was Eastern influence, you know, a lot of Eastern people would, well, people were moving all throughout the world. Um, so I, I'm not sure. Uh, but it is not the Nazi swastika. It is what I call the Eastern swastika. But I call it that. Don't get me wrong. That's not the real name, but I call it that because it seems that that's where it originated. Uh, Puto Graziani, hollow cast bronze, which is engraved uh, in the Etruscan inscription, to the god Texans as a gift. Texans was the protectress of childhood. And this was around the second century before Christ. So as you can see, the Etruscans were quite handy at making things, you know, very handy at making things. Uh, the Romans down south a little further seemed to be better at building things, building large buildings, large columns, uh, building the aqueduct that move water from one side of the, of the world to the other, uh, built uh, highways and byways. Uh, now, another thing you're, you're going to see is uh, during the Roman Republic, and now we're entering into the Roman Republic, you're going to see the sign over here, S S P Q R S P Q R And... Uh, SPQR, um, excuse me a second, uh, SPQR and the banner, you know, the SPQR banner, uh, which was the emblem of the Roman Republic, uh, the Roman emperor and the kings and anyone of power, uh, singular power, you know, one power up at the top, wore a wreath very similar to this. Uh, sometimes that wreath would be made out of gold, sometimes out of silver, uh, and that represented, you know, kind of, it was kind of the equivalent of the of the crown. Um, but the SPQR means Senatus Populusque Romanus, Romanus, um, which actually uh, it's a compound word uh, that means uh, the Roman Senate and people. So in other words, the Roman Senate uh, represented the people. And the Roman Senate uh, was very important, very important for the people. Uh, and they really served the people quite well. Uh, they made sure that money was flowing through the treasury. They made sure roads were being built. It's funny that uh, in spite of how good the Senate was, the Roman people like humans, fell for a cult figure, right? A cult figure meaning Julius Caesar. Julius Caesar was a hero, and they wanted to get rid of the Senate and put him in as, a, as an emperor, which is kind of crazy. Well, the Senate assassinated, killed Julius Caesar. Uh, but uh, but it's, it's kind of funny because the Senate really was an important component of the, uh, you know, of the, of the formula that made uh, Rome uh, successful. 
Um, now, stories say that Rome's last king, Tarquinius Superbus, misused his power. This inspired the people of Rome to overthrow him and set up a new government. Rome became a republic. This is at the point at which Rome became a republic. Instead of having a king, it was ruled by two consuls. They served for just one year. There were sometimes that only one guy would serve, but usually two. Uh, the popular assemblies elected the councils. They weren't called emperors. They weren't called presidents. They weren't called kings. Uh, they were called councils. Uh, assemblies were made up of groups of Roman citizens. Other magistrates, such as praetors, had power too. Uh, though the Senate had existed under the kings, its power grew during the Roman Republic. For example, it controlled spending, like I was telling you before. It was made up of patricians. Patricians were the rich governing class uh, or, or the members of the oldest families. The statue uh, is thought to be Lucius Janius Brutus. He helped found the Roman Republic and was one of the first councils. Uh, and, and this is important for you guys to remember. Uh, what I find is that the history of Rome is so expansive, so huge, and so many things happened in such a short period of time uh, that it is impossible to know every detail. Uh, and it's better to remember specific things, you know, specific occurrences, specific occurrences and what certain things or groups of people meant, right? What certain groups of people meant. And like I, like I told you, while there was a Senate, uh, when the kings were there, they were not powerful. The Senate was not powerful. Uh, they only handled minor administrative duties. Once the king was out of the way, and the, then the Senate picked up a lot of power. Uh, and the councils could only serve for, for one year. And, uh, and they were not able to do too much because the Senate would step in and say, no, you cannot do that. And the Senate would vote and not allow these councils to do whatever the heck they wanted to. Um, according to tradition and later writers such as Livy, uh, the Roman Republic was established around 509 BC when the last of the seven kings of Rome, Tarquin the Proud, was deposed by Lucius Canius, Brutus, and a, and a system based on annual elected magistrates and various representative assemblies was established. The Constitution set a series of checks and balances and a separation of powers. The most important magistrate were the two councils who together exercised executive authority, such as imperium or military command. The councils had to work with the Senate, which was initially an advisory council on the ranking nobility or patricians, but grew in size uh, and power. Other magistrates of the Republic include tribunes, uh, aediles, praetors, and censors. The ma magistracies were originally restricted to patricians, but were later open to common people, to the plebes, to the plebeians, plebeians or plebes. Uh, Republican uh, voting assemblies included the Comita Centuriata, the Center Assembly which voted on matters of war and peace and elected men to the most important offices and the Comitia Tributa, uh, Tributal Assembly, which elected less important offices. And if you look today at the, whoops, and if you look today at the setup of, uh, of the United States were very similar to Rome, very, very similar to Rome. Um, in reality, we have a Senate, we have a president, we have a uh, Congress, and all of that uh, is checks and balances, checks and balances. Um, some important events during the Roman Republic, the Gauls, 
invaded uh, Rome. And uh, let me see, let me get rid of this little floating bar. Okay. Uh, the Gauls in the fourth century BC uh, had come under attack uh, by the Gauls, who now extended their power in the Italian peninsula beyond the Po Valley and through Etruria. On the 16th of July, 390 BC, a Gaelic army under the leadership uh, tribal chieftain Brennus met the Romans on the banks of, of the Alia River, 10 miles north of Rome. Brennus defeated the Romans and the Gauls marched to Rome. Most Romans had fled the city, but some barricaded themselves upon the Capitoline Hill for a last stand. So if you want to see where these guys came from, we got to go back right here. And the Gauls came from just north of the Celts. In fact, they were, they used to mix with the Celts. They were about here. And uh, they, they had a lot of dealings with the Celts. They were similar people. Uh, they intermarried in many cases. Uh, and, and these are the guys that decided to work their way down this way and attack Rome over here and attack Rome. And this again was very common back in those days. Uh, people were always trying to steal from the guy next door. You know, they were always trying to steal from somebody. Uh, but just to show you uh, the difference between Rome and guys like the Gauls, uh, when uh, the Gauls actually made it inside of the city, uh, they looted the city, right? The Gauls looted and burnt the city, then laid siege, siege on the Capitoline Hill. The siege lasted seven months. The Gauls then agreed to give the Romans peace in exchange for 100 pounds of gold. According to later legend, the Romans supervising the way noticed that the Gauls were using false scales. <laughs> you know, they were trying to cheat the Romans. The Romans then took up arms and defeated the Gauls. Their victorious general Camillus remarked, with iron, not with gold, Rome buys her freedom. And this was a, actually a turning point for Rome. They realized that they could not be softies anymore. They couldn't be nice guys, really, literally. They couldn't be nice guys, and they had to take up arms because just beyond the borders of them and other people, there were guys like the Gauls who were savages, who were crazy, and wanted to pillage. They wanted to invade and pillage. Pillage meaning steal. They weren't looking to gain territory, and that was the difference between Rome and the Gauls. The Gauls were just thieves. The Romans wanted to take over land and govern large areas, and that was a big, big difference. So here's another one of those things that you got to remember. Uh, the Gauls were thieves. The Romans, they were empire builders. They were empire builders. Uh, the Romans gradually subdued the other people of the Italian peninsula, including the Etruscans. The last threat to Roman hedge money in Italy came when Tarentum, a major Greek colony, enlisted the aid, the aid of Pyrrhus, of Epirius in 281 BC. But this effort failed as well. The Romans secured their conquest by founding Roman colonies in strategic areas, thereby establishing stable control over the region of Italy they had conquered. And this thing with the Gauls and this thing with Pyrrhus were learning occasions for the Romans. They realized that they were living in a very tough neighborhood. They were living among a bunch of people that would not for a second uh, not want to come into Rome and rip them off and invade them and burn the city down and take all their gold. So they started adjusting. 
Number one adjustment was they became a military power. Number two, they began to create little villages and, uh, you know, and, and, uh, and, and, and little forts all around Rome in order to protect it. So this was a real learning occasion. Pyrrhus, by the way, uh, beat Rome, but they lost an incredible amount of people. And today we have a, uh, uh, a uh, idiomatic expression that's called a pyrrhic uh, uh, victory. And a pyrrhic victory means that you win, but you lose so much that it's not worth it, that it really isn't worth it. Anyway, who were the Gauls? Gauls, Latin Gallia, French Gaul, is the name given by the Romans to the territories where the Celtic Gauls, Latin Galli, blah, 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 lived, including present day France, Belgium, Luxembourg, and parts of the Netherlands. So they went all the way up, all the way up to uh, Holland, to what is Holland today, Switzerland, Germany, on the west bank of the Rhine and the uh, Po Valley in present day uh, Italy. Uh, so they, they had all this area, the Gauls had all this area up here, all of this area up here. Uh, and they had a very expansive area, but the reality was that they weren't very sophisticated. Um, for the most part, they were farmers. Uh, they, their army was not a professional army like the Romans. Uh, their army was made up of thieves and crooks and uh, guys that would say, I joined the army so that I can go and pillage a nation or a place, a country and steal and then bring back the gold for me and my family. Unlike the Romans who had a professional army, the army got paid by the Senate, by the government. And, uh, and they became very professional. And we're going to talk about that at the end. They wore the same uniform. They had weapons that were the same. They were, you know, they were really, really put together. They were really buttoned up and they were very much put together. And that was, that was the basic, that was the major difference. These guys were amateurs. The Romans were professionals and they were, and the Romans were really serious about what they were doing. Um, consequently, Rome became as, as big as it did. Uh, now, here's another event uh, you must remember, the Punic Wars. Uh, in the third century BC, Rome faced a new and formidable opponent, Carthage, Carthage, remember Carthage. Carthage was a rich, uh, rich uh, flourishing Phoenician city state that in Tended to dominate the Mediterranean, intended to dominate this whole area over here. And they came from here. You know, Phoenicians, they were associated, they were part of the Greek Empire, and they were seafaring people, and they wanted to dominate this whole area here. Um, the two cities had originally become allies in order to fight back Pyrrhus, this guy here. However, they eventually became enemies as Rome gained influence over the land and Carthage over the sea, right? And Carthage over the sea. Carthage was right here, this area right here, right? This was all Carthage and here's Rome. And they uh, basically, at first they were buddies. They had come together in order to fight this, this Turkey over here, um, who was trying to take over the whole thing. Uh, and they would trade, but eventually, these guys became jealous of the Romans. The Romans wanted to take over and, you know, la, 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 just like it always happens. And then they, they became enemies. And uh, by the way, what does the word Punic mean pertaining to or characteristic of, the, of Carthage or Carth, uh, Carthaginians from the Latin Punicus, uh, earlier uh, Punicus, uh, Carthaginian, originally a Phoenician place, Carthage having been founded as a Phoenician colony from Punis, from, you know, all that stuff. The Punic Wars were three wars. And remember this, there were three Punic Wars. Punic one, Punic two, Punic three, right? Punic one, two, and three. Um, what does the word Phoenician means? It comes from um, 
uh, Phoenicia was the ancient Sem uh, Semitic speaking Thassalo, uh, Thala Socratic state uh, civilization that originated in the Levant region of the Eastern Mediterranean. So it's a, it's, it's a people that were here on this part of the Mediterranean. So just remember that. But the important thing, don't worry so much about what the word Phoenician means. Remember, and I'm trying to give you the things to remember, the seven kings, the Roman Republic, um, you know, the Punic Wars, three Punic Wars, three Punic Wars. Uh, the first Punic War began in 264 BC when the city of Messana asked for Carthage help in their conflict with Hero II of Syracuse. After the Carthage, uh, Car Carthaginians intercession, Messana asked Rome to expel the Carthaginian and that started the first war. Rome entered this war because Syracuse and Messana were too close to the newly conquered Greek cities of Southern Italy, mainly Sicily. And Carthage was now able to make an, an offensive through Roman territory along with this, Rome could extend its domain over Sicily. So it's all about, the first war was all about, how can I say it? Uh, uh, the complications of war, uh, a combination of land, the combination of riches, a combination of a friend that you wanna protect. And then all of a sudden things become crazy and instead of making friends, they go to war. That was the first war. And the first war, the Carthaginians lost. Rome, you know, Rome was an army that was difficult to deal with, and they lost. Uh, although the Romans had experienced in land battles, defeating the new enemy required naval battles. Carthage was a maritime power. They knew how to deal with boats. Uh, and the Roman lack of ships and naval experience made the path to the, to the victory a long and difficult one for the Roman Republic. But they, they did overcome Carthage anyway. They beat them, even though they, they almost got beat because Carthage had the ships, they had the Navy. Despite this, after more than 20 years of war, Rome defeated Carthage and a peace treaty was signed. Among the reasons for the Second Punic War was the subsequent war reparations Carthage acquiesced to at the end of the First Punic War. So what happened was the Romans beat Carthage and they come over and they say, it's your fault. You got to pay us now reparations. That's what the word reparations mean. Reparations mean fixing, fixing what you broke, fixing what you broke. So they asked for this, you know, this history repeats itself. This is the same thing that happened during First World War. Uh, the West, the Western powers or the, the uh, allies got Germany and Austria to pay incredible reparations after Germany and Austria lost First World War. And that cost the Second World War. Hitler came in and said, no, we can't allow this. We got to beat them. So history repeats itself. History repeats itself. Um, I'm not, I don't want to go into these two guys right here. You can read about them later. We have to move along a little bit. But let's say that the first Punic War, the, uh, the Carthage lost, uh, and that created the second Punic War, the reparations, the money that they had to pay. Now, in the Second Punic War, and this is a very important one to remember, a guy by the name of Hannibal, right? The Second Punic War is famous for its brilliant generals on the Punic side, Hannibal, and Hasdrubal on the Roman, Marcus, Claudius, Marcellus, Quintus, and so forth and so on. Rome fought this war simultaneously with the First Macedonian War. The war began with the audacious invasion of Hispania by Hannibal, son of Hamilcar Barca, a Carthaginian general who led operations on Sicily toward the end of the First Punic War. Hannibal rapidly marched through Hispania 
to the Italian Alps, causing panic among Rome's Italian allies. The best way found to defeat uh, Hannibal's purpose of causing the Italians to abandon Rome was to delay the Carthaginians with a guerrilla war of attrition, a strategy propounded by uh, Quintus Fabius Maximus, who would be nicknamed Cunctator, the layer, and whose strategy would be forever after known as Fabian. Due to this, Hannibal's goal was unachieved. He could not bring enough Italian cities to revolt against Rome and re replenish his diminishing army. And he thus lacked the machine and manpower to besiege Rome. This is very, very important. The Second Punic War, remember this, because Hannibal, how did Hannibal, does anybody know how Hannibal fought this war? Does anybody know? I will give you an apple. It will have to be a drawn apple because I can't give it to you physically. It will have to be a virtual apple but I will give you a virtual apple if you can tell me how Hannibal fought this war. So, my, my elephants? Yes, indeed, you got an apple. You, my dear friend, you get an apple. Whoops, you get an apple. You get this big apple right here. And here is the leaf of the apple. It's a leaf that's kind of looking down. But here's your apple. You get an apple. You get an apple for knowing that he fought with elephants. He fought with elephants. He created a strategy that was, uh, that was based on elephants. Uh, elephants were um, big, they were like tanks, they were the tanks of that era, and they were scary, they were scary as could be, and, uh, and imagine a group of soldiers seeing this three-ton beast coming at them, and a guy all the way up on top of the, the, uh, the what do you call it, the, uh, the elephant throwing spears and arrows and things like that. And that's how Hannibal, cre and he created all of these different ways of attacking with apples, I mean, with, uh, with elephants. And he made it through the Alps. Now, if, we, if you want to see the Alps, um, how the Alps played in all of this, I think I've got... Uh, uh, I might, 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 uh, well, the, the Alps are right over here. Um, but anyway, more than half a century after these events, Carthage was humiliated and Rome was no more concerned about the African menace. The Republic's focus now was only to the Hellenistic kingdoms of Greece and revolts in Hispania. However, Carthage, after having paid the war indemnity, felt that, the, that its commitment and submission to Rome had ceased, a vision not shared by the Roman Senate. And this would start it, the, uh, the Second uh, Punic War. But yeah, the elephants. He got elephants and it was, uh, he almost made it. He almost made it all the way into Rome. He failed at making it all the way. And you can see this. Here's another video that you should watch, the Second Punic War. Uh, it'll tell you all about it, how, uh, uh, how Hannibal used the elephants and all of that stuff. Uh, but uh, the reason why he failed in the Second Punic War was because he didn't have what's called machines, machinery. And, uh, and machines are these towers that you can take up to a wall and you can climb over the wall and then invade a city. Also, a machine back in those days was a catapult. 
you know, you would take a catapult and put a big rock on it and shoot that catapult at the city that you were invading. He did not have that. Hannibal didn't have that because he tried to cross the Alps and that prevented him from carrying all of that extra equipment. Had he had machines, right? The things to climb over walls, the catapults to throw rocks, the catapults to throw fire. You know, they would take a big ball of cotton or something flammable and they would put a fire to it and then they would shoot it onto the city that they were trying to invade and that would burn the city. Had he had that, he, he would have he won the war. He would have won the war because he was a great, great general. He really knew uh, what was going on. And then came the third Punic War after they had beaten, um, as Carthage fought with Numidia without Roman consent, the third Punic War began when Rome de declared war against Carthage again in 149 BC, Carthage resisted well at the first strike and the participation of the, all the inhabitants of the city. However, Carthage could not withstand the attack of Scipio uh, who entirely destroyed the city and its walls, enslaved and sold all the citizens and gained control of the region, which became the province of Africa. Thus ended the Punic War period. So that, remember that there were three wars. The first war was a stupid war. The second war, Hannibal took his elephants and almost, almost defeated Rome. And the third war, by then, Carthage was nothing. They got into a fight with somebody that Rome did not want it to happen. Rome invaded them, totally wiped them out, and they made them a province, made them a province of Rome. They then became part of Rome at that point. So remember that. Okay, so we've reached the end of the class. And so thank you very much for answering that question so eloquently and so nicely. I really appreciate it. Um, does anybody have any questions? There's not too many people left, it seems like. Uh, but if any of you, I think we only have five people left. If any of you five people have any questions, please ask now um, because time is short and uh, we only have about a minute left. I'm going to put this here. End of second class and I'm going to give it a date. Uh, 5 21 2021. How does that sound? Um, whoa, what happened here? So ask whatever you will. Um, does it make sense? What I have described so far, does it give you a sense of Rome? Does it give you a sense of the evolution, how Rome evolved from a kingdom to a republic, you know, to an, to an empire. Uh, does it give you a sense of why Rome did some of the things that they did? Uh, why they became such, well, why they became such bloodthirsty people? Eh, I don't know, I don't know why. People back in those days were crazy anyway, um, but, and they were just as crazy. So if you have no questions, and I see somebody is sending a chat through, uh, should it be 321? Yeah, maybe, you're probably right. Wait, wait a minute. Ah, what am I doing? 321. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I don't know what I was thinking about. I guess because five is my favorite number. Um, so anyway, so if we're gonna leave it here, one thing to say, what is it? See you later, alligator. See you later, alligator. Bye. 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 Thank you.